Hello and welcome to the Sunday Morning Corner Man. On this episode of the SMC, we discuss all the relevant fights of UFC 240. I will do all of this with the co-host of the Sunday Morning Corner Man, who can be read at Sherdog, Cage Side Press, Fan Sided, and Heard on Loudmouth MMA on Between the Links, where he is absolutely certifiable, the great Keith Schilling. Keith, what's up? What's up, brother? How you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic. This was not a overly um, exciting card, but I really have a lot to say about the main event. And, and the main card, so let's get into it. Keith, we did this last week, so let's do it this week. Let's get this thing started with some facts about UFC 240, a UFC featherweight championship bout between current champion Max Holloway and former UFC lightweight champion Frankie Edgar headlined the event. The pairing had been scheduled twice before, first at UFC 218 and then again at UFC 222. In both instances, the fights were scrapped by uh, because of injuries to the respective fighters. A women's flyweight bout between former Invicta FC Bantamweight champion Laura Murphy and Mar Romero Borella was initially scheduled for this event. However, June 20th, promotion officials elected to move that bout to UFC on ESPN, Covington versus Lawler, which is coming up next week. A heavy bout between Tanner Boser and Giacomo Lemos was scheduled in the event. However, it was reported on July 25th, 2019. The bout was scrapped due to Lemos testing positive for an unspecified banned substance. This is the second time the UFC has come to Edmonton. The last time was UFC 215, a card that you may remember having the second fight between Valentina Shevchenko and Amanda Nunez. Amanda Nunez won a split decision. Javier Dos Anjos defeated Neil Magny with a first round or a first round uh, finish submission. And Henry Cejudo, who was beltless at the time and a full time flyweight at the time, defeated Wilson Hayes by TKO in the second. Last Edmonton fact. I bungee jumped at the West Edmonton Mall 100 years ago when I was still in the military. With all those things being said, I thought this car was a little lean for a pay-per-view. They must really think the combination of Holloway's greatness and Edgar and Cyborg's resumes will be enough. Keith, did you think it was enough? No, I don't think it was enough. Um, I think I think there's only a handful of stars that can draw uh, pay-per-view buys on their name value. Alone. John Jones... Uh, probably Habib now, uh, Connor, maybe one or two other guys I'm not thinking of. That's it. The rest of the rest of the paper has got to be stacked all the way through. Um, you're not really selling me with Christoph Yako open up the pay per view card. Um, on paper, this was not a good card. And if you look at the betting lines, the two co main events, there was two fighters that was highly favored. I think Max Holly was like a plus, I mean, a negative 500 favorite. Chris Cyborg was even bigger than that, like a negative 800 favorite or something like that. So when you have you know, your two main cards being fights that most people did not expect it to be competitive, and then the rest of the card being a bunch of people that most people don't know who they are, you're not going to sell a lot of pay views. I actually watched it at Buffalo Wild Wings instead of watching it at home. Yesterday I had a couple of friends meet me there. I mean, the place was pretty empty. Yeah, I was kind of in the, in the same boat. I mean, I, I went out to watch it as well. Um, so again, this is something we can get into a little bit later, but I will say this. It's upsetting, and we know the way of the world, and we know how you know fights are built and cards are put together. It is a little bit upsetting that two guys like Frankie Edgar and Max Holloway, who are everything that's right with this sport, can't draw better. But, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not going to... It's weird, you know, it, it's upsetting, but what are you going to do? I mean, that's that's the nature of the business. That's what we're, that's what we're dealing with, so... It is what it is, right? Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, it is. You said it's, that's Max Holloway's line. It is what it is. Unfortunately, there's only a handful of guys who draw people. That, and another thing that hurts them is you're competing against summer activities. I mean, how many people, you know, go to the beach or they build a fire or they go on vacation or they do whatever they do, go camping, you know, during the last week of July. So you're also competing against that. They have people – give up their Saturday night to watch fights. Most people aren't going to do it for nice guys like Max Holloway and Frankie Edgar. That's true. All right, speaking of Max Holloway and uh, Frankie Edgar, let's get to him. Keith, Max Holloway was on a 13-fight winning streak coming into this fight Saturday night with Frankie Edgar. That streak is, of course, at featherweight, a distinction that is important because he was coming into the fight off a loss, his first in nearly six years. Frank Yeager is a fighter that, despite his age and longevity in the sport, still seems to be fighting up near the top. His last six years have only had losses to Jose Aldo and Brian Ortega. However, both men lost 
decisively to Holloway. So the question coming in, Keith, was will MMA math hold true or could Edgar have seen something in the Poirier fight to aid him in taking Holloway's belt? That was the question and the short answer was no. Holloway looked sharp in the stand-up and nullified Edgar's takedowns en route to a unanimous decision. Keith, that's what I saw. What did you see? Yeah, I mean, you you summed it up perfectly. I had a 49-46 for Holloway. I know one of the judges had a 50-45. I'm okay with that. Uh, I gave Edgar the first round. I thought he squeaked it out, but it was very close. And then I gave Holloway the last the last four rounds. Um, I thought Holloway had a perfect game plan. He used his range. Um, he kind of played it a little safe. He was, uh, If you notice, he was crouching way down to kind of really defend the takedowns. Just use the jab. He was timing Edgar coming in with his right hand and and showed incredible takedown defense in this game. And, and it's, I heard someone else say, well, will Frank Diego take anything from Dustin Poirier? Like before the fight started, will he take anything from the Dustin Poirier fight? The problem is, is you're going like two ends of the, of the spectrum. Poirier's bigger than Holloway, stronger than Holloway. Edgar's the complete opposite. He's smaller than Holloway. He's, he, you know, him and Poirier fight differently. Poirier was landing power shots. Frank Edgar's never, I mean, other than that one knockdown, I mean, knockout, excuse me, of Chad Mendez. He was never big a one punch, big punch guy. Um, I mean, I did he did catch Gray Maynard once too, but that was like an all out war that you know was a little bit of accumulation. But to you know, the, it was just such a tough stylistic matchup for Frankie, especially at this age too. He's I think he's thirty seven. You know, think of all the wars he's had, the Gray Maynard's wars, and, and Jose Aldo fights and stuff. And it, it, he had a very tough task in front of him. And, I thought he did as well as we could expect. All right, let's talk about this. I, I got a couple things from this fight that I want to run by you because you know I, you know, I, I come up with crazy shit and I throw it at you and then we go with it. So I Somewhere compared, in the middle. last night I compared um, Max Holloway to John Jones, and here's how I've compared it to the, the two of them. The comparison was that they are both skilled enough to overcome the fact that their one glaring weakness is they're kind of light in the ass for their divisions. But both of them maximize the thing that makes them unicorns in their division, which is their lankiness, their reach. Obviously, that that is exacerbated in a fight with Frankie Edgar if you're Max Holloway. But he's fought other guys, and that still has been an advantage, right? Brian Ortega's a more normal featherweight than maybe Frankie Edgar is. Frankie Edgar is short in all divisions but bantamweight. So do you think that that's just going to be Max's thing that he has, and it's going to be very difficult for people to... Because Let me transition into the other thing, which is the two people who have defeated Max Holloway, you can make a case are somewhat similar in Dustin Poirier and Conor McGregor. They're both southpaw strikers, they both have fairly long arms, and they're about the right size for the division. So is that the recipe to beat Max Holloway, or is that just a coincidence? Uh, I, think it's, I think it's a little bit of a coincidence because you're talking about... You know, I'm assuming you're talking about the first Poirier fight at Featherweight. You're talking about Holloway is 20 years old. To compare that to 27-year-old Holloway, it's really tough. Um, I like the comparison to John Jones, uh, especially the way they both use their range so well. Um, I think Poirier, excuse me, uh, Holloway uses, he has a lot more pace into his fights, his output. It is very important to him how much uh, pressure he puts on a fighter. Well, I think John is a lot more creative. John kind of like sucks you out of your game plan. And, and John is a lot better to clinch than Max Holloway is. But generally speaking, the range and how difficult, how both guys will always get you fighting at with the style of fight they want is so important. And uh, I think we saw that again this Saturday. What's the strategy to beat Max Holloway? I don't know, man. I, I really, I mean, Poirier had power shots, and, and that was huge. And if you touch Holloway, you're probably going to have to hurt him. I don't know if anybody at Featherweight can hurt him. Now, I think it's inevitable that he'll have to move up. I don't know how much longer he can make the weight, especially as he gets older. Uh, but for the time being, man, it's going to be hard. And then you think about the next guy who's going to face him is probably Alex Volkanovski. I mean, that seems like it's, it's a done deal. And you have another shorter guy who's going to have to deal with this huge reach. Um, and I'm huge on, on uh, Alexander Volkanovsky. I just I can't see where he gets it done against Max Holloway. So, but do you – I guess my, my question is, do you see 
we've talked a little about Volkanovski. Do you th- see the rest of the division having the problems with Max Holloway that the 205-pound division has with John? Meaning there's nobody on the horizon that you can see that could take this guy's 145-pound belt. Yeah, yeah, I do. The only person I think that could really hurt Max is just his age. It, it, as he gets older and he gets more mature, it's going to be hard for him to get to like and eventually sucking his body to make weight may drain his cardio. And if you take away his cardio, you take away his pace, that is completely changes Max Holloway altogether. But to pick a person, I mean, Zabit's really Zabit's really long. He's a long ranging guy. He might he, his range might work. He's got good wrestling, good kicks. Um, but I think we really over exaggerate, over credit. I think we actually make him better than he is. I don't think his striking is nearly so, especially his defensive. He gets hit a lot. He's got hit a lot. In fact, I mean, Kyle Marsniak was, was teeing off on him at times. I couldn't imagine what Max Holloway does to the beat. You know, but if he's young and he could obviously improve, but I just I don't see anybody at Featherweight right now that's that can match Holloway's pace, match his outfit, land power shots, avoid I mean, Max is so accurate. His timing is so good. Frank Yeager changes things up. That's that's like the thing about Frank Yeager is that Every time he comes at you, he's going to come at you with a different combination. He's going to come at you with a different pace. He's, he's going to bounce in and out of range. And while Frank Yeager is so hard to read, Max was still timing him. And they find somebody, other guys who don't fight like Frank Yeager, who fight at the same pace, same, same tempo. I just, I don't see it. I don't, I don't know who beats Max Holloway right now. Yeah, I agree. It's going to be tough. I, I think that one of the things that may do him in, and this isn't a bad thing, is the thirst for the next belt. You know, he went up to 55 already to try and get get it from Poirier or, you know, get into the conversation. I think he's going to want another belt. Uh, 55 is the only one that makes sense, obviously, based on his health. Health, 35 yeah. is kind of out, of out of the question, size and, and some of his past. So I yeah. think that, so, might be, that might be where the division opens up. He takes a little sabbatical, maybe fights, maybe earns his way up to a fight with Khabib, and then 45 starts to move on without him and, and somebody emerges. Yeah. Fluctuating his weight. It's probably never a good thing to keep going up, bulking up, coming down. That's that's not a good positive. And plus, taking a beating like he did before, and, and it wasn't a one side fight; it was a very good fight. But just go through a war like that, take that amount of damage. That's never a good thing either. So that stuff might catch up to him, and, and you know, time catches up to everybody except for Tom Brady. But everybody else it catches up to. Him. All right, Keith. Let's move on. There's a lot swirling around Chris Cyborg right now. Her veil of invincibility. I- Hold on a second. Go I ahead. thought for sure you were going to ask about the Jose Aldo, who's the greatest featherweight champion. I tell you, I'm so glad we're not doing that today. Okay, we'll save that for another day. I have points. I have points for that, just in case you brought up, but I'd rather save <laughs> We'll wait on that. All, All right. right, let's move on to the co-main event, Keith. There's a lot swirling around Chris Cyborg. Her veil of invincibility has been lifted by Amanda Nunez. She is on the last fight of her contract, and negotiations with Dana have always been strained. Bellator is out there because she used to work for Scott Coker and Strikeforce. The PFL is out there because she could win a million dollars and fight Kayla Harrison. And amid all these distractions stands Felicia Spencer, a fighter so skilled in her grappling that she has been compared to those in a know by uh, compared to Misha Tate. By those in the know, Spencer coming in with a relatively quick turnaround after she uh, strangled Megan Anderson in the first round of the Coco main event of UFC on ESPN plus 10, Dos Angeles versus Lee, but RDA has fought again, and sometimes you have to strike when the iron's hot. This was a huge opportunity for Spencer, and she lost. But that doesn't tell the whole story. I want to say she looked impressive. Uh, she put a few good ones on Cyborg that, Cyborg that she'll be seen in the mirror for the rest of her life. Keith, I want to talk about the performance because the fight, as all fights, requ- requires some context. Whenever someone tells me a fighter has a good chin, part of me always says, well, so they can just get their ass whipped effectively? Is that kind of what you're telling me? So yeah. I thought Spencer held her own. But again, it's the, ta- it's the thing we talk about all the time. It's progression versus regression. That's the discussion. So are we? So I'll simply ask it this way. Did you see that Spencer has progressed or do you feel like Cyborg has regressed? Well, before I answer that question, I want to address something. It's like when people say someone has a good chin, what they also say is they have bad defense. They're hittable. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think it's – I don't think it's – you know what I'm going to say somewhere in between? 
but I don't think it. I actually think Cyber looks fantastic. I don't know what this narrative was. I, I'm listening to Joe Rogan talk yesterday, and I'm like, is he watching the same fight I'm watching? He's making it sound like Chris Cyber is losing. I'm throwing out 10, 8 rounds for her. And I'm like, what is he talking about? He's beating the, she is beating the brakes off of Felicia Spencer right now. I'm like, what is he talking about? And then I'm looking at people saying like, oh, she lost a step. I'm like, I thought she looked fast. I thought her cardio looked great. Joe Rogan saying, oh, she's draining herself. She looks tired. And I'm like, you see the output she put on? She landed 122 significant strikes. You know what that is? This is Chris Cyborg. That's a new record. That's the most significant strike she's ever landed in a fight. And what's even crazier? That was a three-round fight. That wasn't a five-round fight. When she fought Holly Holm, which is the second most she landed, it was 118 strikes, significant strikes. She out, she outdid that in less in two less rounds in a fight which was very grappling heavy. But Spencer was was taking big portions of the fight, turning and pressing her against the cage, trying to use her her weight and stuff. And I'm like, what the hell is Joe Rogan talking about? I thought Chris Cyborg would. Fantastic. I was I picked her to win. I, I expected her to win easily, but I was a little worried she'd come out gunshot. You know, she it was her first loss in 13 years. She got knocked out. She got knocked out a minute, you know, just over a minute or whatever it was, under a minute. And you see fighters come out very tempted after a loss. I mean, per, just look a week ago with Alex Hernandez. I mean, he, he was gunshot. He was moving. Chris Cyborg did not do that. The first 10 seconds of the fight, she's coming out being same old Chris Cyborg, trying to end the fight with every single punch. And I thought she looked fantastic yesterday, which is perfect going into her free agency. To me, it's like the, the amount of doors that are open for her right now is, I mean, you've named some of them. I think you left out a couple other ones. If I'm her, if I'm her manager right now, I would be so happy. Okay, so then let's spin it forward. What, um, what do you think she should do? I think she. Would, I mean, I think if I was her manager, I'd say the thing: take the biggest money. Whoever gives you the most money, um, who who would give her the most money? Probably Bellator. Um, I spoke with Scott Coker um, when they were in New York City. I asked her about, "Hey, Chris Cyborg's got one fight left. Are you interested?" And he was very interested. He was asked about it a week, you know, a little while after that. Again, kind of changed his tone a little bit, saying like, "Hey, she's not a free agent. Let's wait." You know, so she's a free agent, but she started putting out feelers of saying, "Hey." You know, I'd like to fight Julia Budd. I actually think Delta has a better featherweight division, this and that. That'd be great. I think the PFL would be great. Throwing her up at 155. Joe Rogan's talking about how much weight cut she loses. Imagine her in the, 50, the 155. Next year's season, guaranteed she gets, you know, four to five fights in that. Um, Ryzen, you know, how they love freak show fights. Her buddy Gabby Garcia is over there. She can go over there and fight there. One championship signing, like, they're, they're trying to sign – then every big name UFC fighter that becomes available, they're trying to make a push in America. I mean, I think Chris Cyborg instantly goes, becomes the face of one championship if they sign her and then they can create a whole featherweight division. Um, but if you're the UFC and you can get maybe, – maybe the UFC even signs it to a one-fight deal like gets a man or a true fight deal. Um, it, I think that's good for her. But she's talked about boxing. She might go the boxing route. And then the ultimate wild card – what if she goes WWE? They've exp she's expressed wanting to do it. I think I don't know if WWE is into into it, but hey, they brought Ronda Rousey, and why not bring Chris Cyborg? You can, and they can make her like the new China. Remember that girl China that was in you know this killing machine who's willing to you know the guy who's willing to fight girls. They could she could be the new 2019 version of China. I mean, there's a lot of possibilities for Chris Cyborg. Well, it gets real interesting because Ronda and Cyborg never fought. Yeah, so I, that I don't WWE know what, I, angle gets real interesting when the fact that they that they would hold. I mean, those two could headline WrestleMania because they never. Yeah, I don't. I real. don't follow wrestling. I don't even know if Ronda's wrestling right now. I don't but, know where she's at, but I know she's she's part of the product. So yeah, I mean, that's how interesting that'd be. Imagine imagine Ronda Rousey having a moment. Say it's uh, like I don't know. If you're a wrestling fan, I could be way off. Imagine Ronda Rousey's fighting at a at a, at a big event or like Monday Night Raw or pay per view. And she's fighting whichever the girl she's fighting, and then out of nowhere, Chris Cyborg comes running down and like, like pile drives her and lets the other girl win. And it's like her big rival comes out and attacks her or something. Like hey, that'd be a great moment for wrestling. Yeah, or you let Ronda clean out the division, and then Cyborg's the only person that she never fought. And she does. I mean, you have a lot yeah. of ways to go. Let's and, spin and, this forward. And, and if you're 
if you're the UFC, I don't think you have to sign Chris Cyborg. I don't think it's a. I don't think it. I don't. I don't overpay for her because she. Now that she lost, and you can establish Amanda Nunes as a star, you can no matter what you have that on her, and it's like, hey, no matter what organization she goes, whatever she does, Belter can make her a bigger star, putting her on free TV stuff like that. Your girl beat her, and then also with the featherweight division basically being non-existent, there's like four girls in the division. You don't really have to build it. You can almost just let that division like dissolve and just or just have people like Kat Singano and Felicia Spencer just fight each other for like irrelevant fights. Um, so if I'm the UFC, I don't overpay. Yeah, I agree. So let's talk about Spencer for a second. How good is she? She's okay. Like I don't. She's tough. I'll give her that. I didn't see anything spectacular from her. I mean, she does those little sidekicks. Um, she did land that elbow. Um, her wrestling is not good. Like it's people talk about her. She's not a good wrestler. But she, if she gets the fight to the ground, she's good. But you know, she's not Sarah McMahon. She's not uh, Tatiana Suarez. Um, and then also, I don't know what the commentary you're talking about. Like they, they were making it seem like she was Damian Maya. If she takes down Chris Cyborg. That was it. She's gonna submit her. I'm like, what is Felicia Spencer? Because she because she submitted Megan Anderson. Megan Anderson made Holly Holm look like Jonah Boros with you know it was wrestling, and and they were making it sound like she was Damian Miley. Like, as soon as he hits the mat, it's all over. I'm like Chris Cyborg competed at Abu Dhabi. Chris Cyborg's a legit black belt. If anything, Chris when they went to the ground, Chris Cyborg won those exchanges, not Felicia Spencer. Um, I see a top five featherweight, but I don't see this great talent. And I and I was one who was excited to see Felicia Spencer in, but there's nothing that, about her that really like ooh like. For example, I, I kind of, you know, she's only in her second fight in the UFC, so she's still kind of new. But, like, I'm way more impressed by uh, Viviana Roger, who fought in the prelims. I'm way more, and obviously, it's different impressing against Alexis Davis than against Chris. So, obviously, I get, I get it's apples to oranges. But, like, Brianna Van Buren is someone I'm more excited about than Felicia Smith. I, I just, I don't see anything special in Felicia Smith. Yeah, I, I'm with you there. I mean, I, I think that, she can, like you said, I think she has the potential to, to be, you know, depending on eras. I mean, female divisions are always, you know, notoriously thin. So she can put a run on, but yeah, you're right. I, I don't see her being like an icon status. I think the, the comparison to Misha Tate's a little bit stretched. And, um, but I think, yeah, like you said, she could be a good fighter. All right, let's move on. The time has come. Your favorite time of the podcast has come, Keith. Let's talk Fortis MMA. Jeff Neal is on a little run here. He hasn't lost a fight since January of 2017 to fellow Contender Series alum Kevin Holland. He's got wins over vets Brian Kamosi and Bilal Muhammad in his last two. On Saturday, he drew Nico Price. Keith, side note, I feel like Nico Price is what you would get if Sage Northcutt had gone to juvie. That's it. That's all I got. Anyway, Price is quickly growing a reputation as a Gotti club, or Toro Gotti club, killer be killed type of fighter. Keith, this kid is out there gunning. Abdul Razak Al Hassan got Price in the first, and then Price got Tim Means in the first. So he is really a sort of live by the sword, die by the sword kind of kid. So the table is set for this fight as much as any table can be set for a Nico Price fight. A Nico Price fight is like a picnic at the beach. You can prepare all you want, but shit's probably going to blow around, right? We can understand <laughs> it, you know, it's going to get a little messy. And this fight certainly held court on that, on that note. Uh, Neil and Price exchanging throughout. We even got a double knockdown, which you don't always get to see. Yeah, um, yeah, Neil got the TKO victory in the second round. I like the way he handled adversity. Uh, he was dropped twice. He dealt with sort of the unpredictable, loose cannon nature of a guy like Nico Price. Uh, what did you see in this one? And what do you think we got in this kid, Neil? He's quietly putting together a nice little resume. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff. I mean, this fight was fantastic. It was awesome. This is I this I think it's the kind of fight we all expect. We expected a banger. Um, it was the fight that um, this, it was actually it's funny because when you, people ask someone asks me which fight you're most excited about without picking the main event, this was my second favorite fight behind the flyweights, and it kind of worked out perfect this time that they were the two most entertaining fights. Uh, Nico Price, I think he summed up perfect. I mean, he he is fun. Whether he wins, whether he loses, the fight's going to be fun. He's got big power. Like he he has this like ultimate like stability. No matter what he's doing, he connects your chin. You could go out. He kind and his reckless abandoned style, where he kind of he's willing to take 
punches, willing to hit. He's kind of not very good defensively. He's like a very poor man's version of Justin Deep. And I don't mean that as an insult to Justin. I mean, I mean, I mean that as a compliment to Nico Price. Like he is just, you know, when you turn on Justin Gaethje, it's going to be fun as hell. And it's the same with Nico Price. Now Jeff Neal is good. That's the only thing I can say about him. Everyone knows I'm biased to Fortis MMA. I'm just like in love with Fortis MMA. He might be the most talented one coming out of Fortis MMA. He's the guy that was talking about. He looks like a contender already. Welterweight division is so stacked that it's hard to get ranked. But when you compare him to the bottom of the top 15 rankings, Vicente Lique, Alessio Dos, Dos Santos, uh, Neil Magny, I feel he's at least equal to those guys now. Like I, I would, I think Neil Magny would be a perfect matchup for him next. A nice test, a veteran, and I take Jeff Neil. But the thing that really impressed me by Jeff Neil is that he engaged in Nico Price's fight and still won, and, and won in spectacular fashion. He is so much more technically sound than Nico Price. And you'd say, hey, he's got to protect his chin. He can't get into a brawl with Nico Price. He got into a brawl and then won it which is so impressive to me. And this kid just keeps getting better. Um, I, I, I think this is the guy that we could see main eventing. By this time next year, I could see him main eventing fight nights. I don't think he'll be main eventing pay-per-views by then, but fight nights. Like, in, you know, top 10 guy in a meaningful matchup. Yeah, I agree. You know, he's, he's an interesting kid in that, I mean, he's clearly green, but there's nothing wrong with that. Like, meaning he can be had. Right when when guys fight him, like a guy like Price is gonna find his chin. So he's not the cle- the super without a doubt prospect kind of guy where it's like he comes in there and sometimes he doesn't give you as much action as you would want because he's just sort of trying to you know keep guys off him and and, and work through. I mean he's in there. He, he, I don't want to say he wants to have as much fun as Nico Price does because nobody wants to have as much fun as Nico Price does. But, I mean, he was in there to, to mix it up, right? I mean, that's what you got to like about the kid. And sometimes he's going to put himself, I, I feel like, through a process of, um, I don't know what, the, what I'm, I'm trying to say here, but like um, where you make some mistakes and learn from him. I'll, I'll figure out what I'm trying to say here in a second. But he's going to put himself in harm's way and learn mm-hmm. from that in a way that some other guys that are protecting themselves may, maybe wouldn't. Yeah, one thing I was really, really, really impressed was that he stayed calm during the chaos. Like, there was chaos going on. He got hit. He got rocked. And he still stayed calm. He didn't, like, he, when, he, when him and Nico were loaded up, he still stayed tight. His punches still weren't telling. He kept coming straight down the pipe. He didn't really start winging. He didn't overcompensate and getting himself knocked out. That was really, really impressive to me. So then what do we do next? What's next for him? I mean, if we talk about the blueprint and, not, and, and moving him and spinning him forward... I like I I I mean I, I know Neil Magny's having a little thing with um, Usada, so I don't I don't know if that fight is even possible, but that's a fight I would like. I think would make sense in a ranking sense. Um, maybe a uh, I mean De Santos is, is is I think a lot of these guys are booked. I'm trying to um, let me see if I have any. Yeah, I put Neil I put Neil Magny next to him. Oh, how about how about uh, Vicente Luque, Mike Perry? That fight's going on. Um, fairly soon. How about the winner of that one? That'd be um, interesting. The power of the power of both those guys, Terry and Vincent, they both got big power. Um, but the technical s- skills of Neil, I think that'd be fun. I could see that as a that fight as a co-main event of a fight night with a you know a bigger fight on top of it, like a RDA. Ver- you know, say say RDA versus Leon. It just happened, but say that was the main event, and then boom, right underneath, say. Vicente Lique and, and Jeff Neal is a co-main event. Man, I'm happy. If you get that fight. Oh, how about this one? They just announced Chris Wyman versus Dominic Reyes is headline in Boston. Imagine Lique and Jeff Neal, co-main event in Boston. I'm ha- I'm going there. I'm happy. Yeah, I like that. And I, I, I like the, the reason why I like him getting the winner of those two fights is that he wins either way. Luque's definitely a more technical fighter. But even if he gets Perry, like even if Perry pulls out the victory and he gets Perry, he's getting a more advanced version of Nico Price. So he's still progressing, right? Nico Price and Mike Perry kind of get in there and get crazy. But I would say that if – I would pick Perry if he fought Nico Price. So I'm just saying I feel like oh, Perry – Oh, really? You, you take Perry over – that would be fun. Let me not get started with you on Mike Perry. We'll be here all day. No, no, no. I'm not trying to be negative. I don't know. 
that, that is that would be a lot. It'd be nice to see Lique beat Perry, and then you match the two winners and the two losers. That'd be cool. Like, I wouldn't mind seeing Perry and Price, man. That'd be a good fight. I think that would be fun. They're both Florida guys. Um, they've Bryce has wanted that fight. I mean, if you go if you go to a card down somewhere in Orlando, Tampa, Miami, that area, I mean, that's you throw that on the main card, that'd be fun. I agree. All right, let's Listen, move on. I don't like Mike Perry. We talk about me, but Mike Perry is entertaining. I have never said he's not entertaining. He's a he's he's fun to watch. I just don't like him as a person, but he's fun <laughs> to watch. All right, all right, Keith. I'm gonna keep this one short. Armon Armon Sarukian got the unanimous decision win over Olivier Aubin Mercier, and for me, it just seemed like Sarukian wanted it more and had the urgency. Did I miss something? Am I reading this wrong? Aubin Mercier's third round was like an all-time horrible round. Showed a real yeah. lack of situational awareness and fight IQ. I mean, am I just way off on this? Or is yeah, the, I, no, I, I, this I, 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 I would actually throw in lack of urgency, too, when he got taken down in the third round. It possibly was one round, one round each, possibly 2 nothing for um, Armand, but it could have been 1-1. One, one. And then he got taken down, and he was like willing to be on bottom, and and what I saw was Mercier needs to be the better grappler. When he's not the better grappler, he's in trouble because he really only had that left kick to the body. One time it landed on the chin with the knee. But once they, once Armin kind of knew that was coming, he didn't have an answer. And he started catching the kicks, taking them down. And if this kid can improve his striking with that wrestling at 22 years old, I mean, this kid is good. Like, he could be a top 10 guy. Or, or better, he's 22. Yeah, I mean, and I, I hate to focus on the negative, especially when, you know, um, Armand put together such a good performance. But so with with OAM here, let's – I mean, it's one of those things where it's, like, such a curious round that you're like, is he injured? Is there something – you know what I mean? Like, I, I, can you make any sense – of why he would do that. There's no way that he could have thought he was up two rounds, right? No, no. I just The only explanation he... for me is you're hurt or you think you're up two rounds. And even then, it's kind of curious. What what could possibly have been going through his mind in this one? I, I don't know. I, I don't know if he was hurt or he, was, what he thought he was. I think he just, I think he kind of broke when he was getting taken down. And I wrestled before, obviously not comparing myself to these guys, but when you wrestle people, you can feel when a guy breaks and he's just kind of hanging on to not get pinned. I felt like that was what happened. Like he seemed like he got broken the third round. When the takedown happened and he couldn't stop it, it seemed like he mentally checked out. Yeah, I mean, I could I could see that because coming in, was, was it he uh, – didn't people think he was the superior grappler? Maybe he thought he was? Like, isn't that kind of well, – I didn't. I didn't. I picked uh, our men to win this one, but – I, I felt like maybe I, maybe I'm off, but I don't know. No, he, he's a, it, it was a good matchup between a wrestler versus a judoka, but it comes back to the debate, and I will take the wrestler over the judoka every time. Okay. All right, let's move on, Keith. I'm going to give props to our colleague Tom Feely in his pre-fight analysis. He said Christoph Joko can sometimes be lured into a boring fight and then give it away, and I'll be damned if that wasn't kind of what I saw. He didn't give it away, but it just. I don't know what from from my perspective. What are we gonna do with this kid? He 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 do some good things and then let you know Mark Andre Barrial back in the fight. And yeah. you know, I, okay. Side note, real quick. I called Mark Andre Barrial MAB, right? This is this is a long standing problem that I have with nicknames, right? And here's so we're gonna establish this now. Once someone is given a nickname, and they Gain some sort of recognition with that nickname. It's theirs forever. Here are the examples. Lawrence Taylor is LT, not LaDainian Tomlinson. Alex Rodriguez is A-Rod, not Aaron Rodgers. And damn it, Keith, Marco Antonio Barrera, former boxer from my 20s, is MAB, not Mark andre Barriot. And if I'm the only one calling him MAB, then, you know, screw me. Because I, I just we need to establish that. There is no not two LTs. There isn't two A-Rods. not two MABs. Anyway, back to the fight. With that settled, what did you see here? I mean, did you see Joko just kind of like, is he one of those guys that just fights to the level of his competition? Or what, what is he? Tell, tell me about this kid. No, you're right. I, actually, I think you might have hit it on the head. I think, I, 
I felt like this fight, I felt like he won it comfortably. I didn't think it was it, he was ever in harm. Um, I thought he, I thought he did well at changing what was happening. I thought when they clinched, he engaged in the clinch. When they were striked, he was the first one to turn into a striking back. And I felt like Bart was always kind of trying to play catch up. And when he finally, when he started to catch up, Jocko changed it up. But I also felt like Jocko could have turned it up a little bit. Same like way I felt with Holloway. Holloway played it very safe. Holloway sat down. He's like, I can just jab. I can just stay this. I can win five rounds. But if Holloway turned it up, maybe that may, that might get him taken down. Right, and that might give Edgar the area to win, but also it probably more likely would have led to Holloway knocking Frankie Edgar out. And I feel like Jocko, if he really turned up the volume, especially in the striking exchanges, he was really winning those. That he may—I don't know if he would have stopped him, but I think he would have put a really solid stamp on this fight. And instead, it kind of was a boring matchup, and he just seemed like he just played it safe. He was like okay with clinching, okay with striking, but never really trying to threaten to. I, I, you know what I felt like? I felt like he was fighting not to lose. Okay. Instead of trying so to then, win. you know, listen, we get into discussions on the, on this podcast, and that's what I think separates us from a lot of other podcasts. So here's the one that I'm going to say with, with uh, Joko, and then we can extend it to Holloway if you want. Is it a fair criticism that as you're watching a fight, you're saying to yourself, this fight should be over right now based on the disparity of skills between the fighter? Or are these fighters free... To win the fights however safely and however, I mean, sh- should we be critical in that way? Should we say Max Holloway should have got Frankie Edgar out of there? Should we say uh, Joko should have got Barry Alt out of there? Or should we just say, listen, they dominated the fight, they won a decision, and then when there we go. Whew, now that is like an age-old question. Do they have a like responsibility to entertain us, really? Um that's tough because it's like the only sport that that happens. Think about this for a second. Seattle Seahawks is, is on the one-yard line, and they throw a pass. If that pass gets caught by the wide receiver, it's an exciting way to win the Super Bowl. Instead of handing off the running back and just getting a one-yard plunge, it's kind of a boring way to win the Super Bowl. But when they throw a pass, it gets interception, and all of a sudden now the coach is the big idiot, and why did they throw a pass? What were they doing? Blah, blah, blah. Well, real quick, let me just let me you just don't do that in MMA. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, let me correct. Well, let me correct my stance on what I'm actually asking. I, I do agree with what you're saying. The larger question, I guess, I'm asking is like when we look at Uriah Hall, and we say based on this guy's skill set, he should be better. Meaning, is it the is it the player or like we we'll use Randy Moss for an example? Like, man, if Randy Moss really cared, he would have been this. Well, he's still a Hall of Famer. So my point is, is when we look at these fighters, should we should we say with them? Should GSP have maximized everything that he was? Or is the fact that he won every fight handily, albeit by decision, his choice of how to maximize his skill set and not up for our interpretation? It's tough. It's, it's, a really, I mean, it's a really solid question, and it's real. I mean, that's way too long for this podcast. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I mean, that. it's a good question. I'm saying we could discuss this in the next hour. Right. Um, it's tough because it's combat sports. If a baseball player isn't really succeeding, because maybe he's not working hard, but in combat sports, you can open yourself up trying to entertain, trying to be exciting, trying to do things and get yourself knocked out. That's not going to happen in baseball. That's not going to happen in basketball. That's not, you know what I mean? So it's so, it really, we can only compare it to itself. We can only compare it in MMA. George St. Pierre probably extended a lot of his career by becoming such a good wrestler. Um, he, him coming back and beating Michael Bisping after being out for four years or whatever it was, as long as, as long as it was, is probably because he didn't take the damage early in his career because he wrestled. If he took damage, he, he went to war with the Josh. If him and Josh Koshik went to war without him jabbing and moving or out wrestling him, if, him and, if he stood in the pocket and banged it out with Tiago Alves or banged it out with Carlos Newton and all these guys, would he have been able to take that kind of damage and come back? Probably not. Um, which is why guys like John Jones and Dan Curtis is now because he's playing a safe leg kick and standing on the outside, not engaging in war. So I, I honestly don't know the answer. I, 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 yeah, it's a tough one. So we'll, we'll, just, we'll just put – I think we should probably have some of these things that we just have to table and sort of always revisit them. And then as we've had more time to think about it, we kind of figure out like what our official stance is on it. All right, let's hit the prelims. Let's start with – 
Vivian Arajo defeating Alexis Davis by unanimous decision, 29-28, 29-28, 29-28. I don't know, man. Maybe I'm under, uh, sort of undercrediting um, Arajo on this one. It seemed like an upset to me. Like, it seemed like it was... I was surprised by this. Uh, you obviously, you know, get deeper into the prelims and all this stuff than I do. Did I? Was I not... Was I underrating Arujo coming in? Well, I picked Arujo, um, but I, I think it, it not an upset, but more of a coming out party to me. I like that because she she um, she, she went against uh, Tulita Bonato. She showed so many like unbelievable skills, fast, precise, like looked like a killer. It was one of the best debuts she had, but it was against Tulita Bonato. It's like, well, I mean, let's see her get tested. And then she gets thrown to a very good fight. Alex, say what you want, Alex Davis. She's always in a war. I mean, she lost her. She lost to Caitlin Shikagan, and she lost to. Uh, she beat Liz Cumber. She lost to Caitlin Shikagan. She lost to somebody else that was really close. But like Caitlin Shikagan might get the next title fight, and Alex, you could make an argument that Alexis Davis beat her. Um, Jennifer Meyer, that was the other one she lost. She also said that was a very close fight that she could have won. Like she could have been on a three fight winning streak, and, and instead of fighting Vivian Arrugia, if she gets those decisions, she's probably challenging Valentina Shevchenko for the title. So that's how good Alexis Davis is. With that said, I mean, Vivian looked fantastic. I mean, she is so fast and so precise, landing at. She looks like she has power. I mean, she, I mean, you look at Alexis Davis' face afterwards. I mean, she was beat up. Like, she was bleeding. She was, I mean, it, it, it did not look, I mean, God, she, she's, she's going to have some permanent scars from this. And um, I think Vivian already looks like a contender. Like, she looks like someone who could be challenging for the title in the next year. Um, the one thing I'm a little worried, she got into MMA kind of late. She's 32 already, which kind of sucks. I was kind of hoping... You know, it should be 27, 26. All right, let's move on to the Figueredo, uh, Figueredo Pantoja fight. Uh, unanimous decision, 30 27 is all the way for Figueredo. What'd you see in this one? This fight was incredible. If, if you haven't seen it, you have to watch it. Um, Figueredo lost to, arguably lost, he, he won, but he arguably lost to Jared Brooks. And to think in such a short time to see what he did to Alex Pantoja, Pantoja's very good. And figure out how easy one to fight. I feel like in a skill sense, taking away the intangibles of like power and cardio, but I mean just the technique, I think Figueredo and Pantoja are very similar. They're both very skilled. But I feel like you take Pantoja and then you give him like a turbo button and it becomes Figueredo. Figueredo just hits harder and throws faster. And it was really, imp- I was very impressed. Like it, you know how we talked about uh, Arugio's coming out party and figure out that Arouse is kind of have a card coming up on it? It's like he went to another level party. Like he just, he graduated. He's had his bridge ceremony. Like he's legit. Figueredo's legit. Um, the question is, who does he fight next? With Flyweight being so, so thin, Suhudo being out, when he comes back, he fights Joseph Enemies. I have no idea who Figueredo fights next. He can't fight for Maggie. He just fought him. He just fought Finn, Pantoja. I, I have no idea who he fights. Maybe Moreno, Oscar, Askarov winner. But to me, that's a that's a that's a lot. You're asking a lot of the winner of that fight to go against Figueroa. I don't know. I'm going to ask this question quickly, and, and I just kind of want to get your thoughts on it. What is if you're a flyweight fighter right now? What are you doing, man? Do you just feel like you're at the mercy of? Um, the future of the division, do you keep Chatri's number handy? Do you, yeah. uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, or do you go up and wait? Like, what's your what? move? Yeah, well, it seems like the U.S. Because, the, because these kind of fights and what's going on in Benavidez's career and the uh, Hoot Formiga just fight. Like, these fights should be resurrecting this division, but it still yeah. feels like it's hanging off the cliff. Yeah, Formiga just fought just Benavidez. They got Benavidez right. in title. Yeah. So, but I mean, there's some good fights in this division, and I feel like it's hanging off a cliff yeah. for no well, reason. There are shittier divisions than this one. Yeah. So, with the USC cutting the division, cutting so many people from the division, has made it shallow. The problem is, it was already a shallow division. The reason why it's 125 pounds. The amount of men who can make 125 pounds is obviously small. Just like heavyweights always going to be shallow because the amount of men that heavy is just like the two. The two extremes are always going to be the shallowest, and then you start the more you get to the middle line, the deeper it gets. Why 170 is so stacked. You know, um, 
So it's always going to be shallow. I think the UFC needs to continue to sign people. But if you're a featherweight, it's going to be aggravating because you have the champ who's doing two weight classes and he's injured. So not only is he holding up the title in two weight classes, he's injured. So that's like the negative about the double champion thing. You have Joseph Benavides who deserves a title fight. He's going to be around. And then if you're figuring it out, like, there's nothing else. You're not going to get the number one contender fight against Benavides. Because according to Dana White, that fight is booked. That's it's Cejudo's next fight is going to be against Joseph Benavides, according to Dana White. So what do you do? You take a chance and fight a Brandon Moreno, or I think Askar Askarov might win that fight. You, you take a hot prospect like Askar Askarov, or you sit on the sidelines, but you sit on the sidelines. So who was talking about coming back late 2019, possibly early 2020? Well, say say he comes back in February, fights Joseph Bruno Vini's fight. Say the quickest he gets a turnaround is four months later, and now you're talking about June. You're talking about a year from now. Sitting on a silence here. And that is if Cejudo doesn't defend the 135 belt in between that, which he probably would. So if you really go another four months from that, you're talking like what, what, September ish, something like that? Of 2020. I mean, that's, that's, just, that's a long time to be sitting around. I mean, is your only play, if you're him, I mean, unless you want to, like you said, get some work in by taking a guy that might take everything you've worked for in one night away from you, is it just really just to go after Cejudo on social media? I mean, is that the game we're playing nowadays, that you start to spend your off time when the when these divisions are in flux? Or, like, if Usman's injured, now you're, like, going after him on social media. Like, is that kind of the play for these guys now? I mean, is that the only play instead of taking yeah, a step it, back? It is. The, it probably is the only play, but you have to be the right person. To do it. Not everyone can do the social media game. No one, not everyone should do the most social media game. I, I love, I don't know if you saw this, but did you see how uh, Jan Blachowicz called out John Jones? He, he didn't call it, he just tossed his name in the ring. The way he said it, he said, I don't have, you know, two million Twitter followers. I don't drive a, a Porsche. I, I don't know exactly what he said. He's like, but I have exciting fights and I'm on this winning streak, whatever. He said, you know, he kind of put his credentials on me. He didn't talk trash, just said, here's my case. These other guys are going to insult him. The other guy's going to show up this book signings and, and harass. I'm not going to do that. That's not me. Here's my case, and I thought it was brilliant. That's what Figueroa is going to do. The problem is he's going to he's on a one fight winning streak, so it's like he's going to have to fight, um, probably rematch Formiga. He's going to have to fight Brandon Moreno. He's going to I mean he's going to have to take fights that seem like so he's already past that. But I mean, there's no other option. Yeah, he's in. He's definitely in a tough spot. So. All right, let's move on to the last two. Jillian Robertson defeated Sarah Frota by TKO via strikes. What do we have in Robertson? Um, I I was impressed by Robertson. Um, I, I'm not believing her to be a contender yet. I don't believe that. Um, but what I was impressed is that Frota was, was um, kind of considered the better grappler, and in the first round it looked like that. But Robinson was so confident in her grappling and that she could stick to this game plan. She could just keep wrestling her, get her to move that she'd, she'd wear out. And it worked. And I was impressed by that. And the crazy thing is, Jillian Robinson is 4 and 1 in the UFC. And I don't know if anybody, would, when she was on the Ultimate Fighter show, which once the show got over, I don't think anybody would say, hey, what is Jillian Robinson's record after five fights in the UFC? I don't think anybody was saying 4 and 1. I think most people have been like uh, 0 and 3 and out of the UFC kind of thing. Um, so yeah, good for her. Yeah, so I'm with you on all that. We can just move on to the first fight. All right, Eric Coke <laughs> defeated Kyle Stewart by the decision 30 27, 29 28, 29 28. I feel like it seems like a thousand years ago when, um, yeah. you know, Cook was up at the top of the division fighting for. Uh, or, or have a featherweight, have yeah. a featherweight, two divisions down, right? Not one to two divisions down. I mean, is this kid kind of? He's only thirty, Keith. I mean, it I seems know. like, he was, yeah, it, he's a different. You know how we just talked about uh, Rujo being thirty-two? It's a different. Even though he's two years younger, the miles, the injuries he has, it's probably good that he's up at welterweight. Maybe the extra weight on him will keep him healthy instead of draining his body, beating himself up. That might be it. Uh, change of scenery, something. Um, I don't think he looked good, but he got a much-needed win. And Kyle Stewart, same exact thing as I said about Choi. He needs to learn how to wrestle because he is terrible at it. 
Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where you talk about, you know, striking while the iron's hot. I mean, this kid was supposed to fight uh, Jose Aldo twice. Aldo yeah. got injured, then he got injured, and mm-hmm. then that was kind of that. You know what I mean? It was yeah. never never to be heard from again. And, I mean, he's fought some, some big guys, but it was never that level. So, you know, it's weird when we see some of these fighters taking these odd fights when they're available, and it's like, ah, maybe you should have waited. You never know, man. You never know what this thing's going to lead to. So sometimes you got to take what, what's what's out there for you and, uh, and just kind of hope for the best. All right, let's move on to the fun stuff. Uh, let's start this week with trending up, trending down. Uh, what would you have? Uh, I got three trending up. Um, I know that's probably a lot. Uh, the first one is uh, Jeff Neal. I mean, he, I think knocking on Nico Price, I think he looks like a contender. Uh, Vivian Arroja, I mean, I'm talking about her already fighting for the flyweight title, so you know that's someone that's trending up. And Davis and Figueredo, I mean, what a performance. He got the biggest win of his career. Um, trending down, I have two trending down. Uh, Olivia Auburn mercier um, he's on a losing streak. This is the guy that a lot of people thought was going to be a future contender. He doesn't look anything near that now. And the other one, it's going to be my first time I didn't give it to a fighter. I think Joe Rogan is trending down. I thought he had one of the worst performances the other night. Uh, I thought his commentary on, on Chris Cyborg was extremely biased. Maybe it was because Cyborg's leaving the UFC or whatnot or possibly leaving the UFC. But it was, I mean, Cyborg was beating the piss out of Felicia Spencer and, and, and Joe Rogan was making it seem like Cyborg was losing. I thought Joe Rogan did terrible the other night. Uh, and we'll get to that here in a second. So, um, <laughs> you know, I'm with you. Uh, obviously, you picked a lot of folks, so we're going to have some 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 crossover. But I, I thought I agree with you on the Erojo pick, and I agree with you on the Aubin Mercier pick. I think both of them uh, are going definitely in different directions. I thought that, you know, um, I, the, the way you described Erojo's um, – Performance is perfect. It was a coming out party. So if so, if that means that's what that was for her, then maybe Aubin Mercier was a going in or going out. Uh, you know, hers was a coming out party. His might be a going out party. So um, you know, we'll see where that goes from there. But that's that's where I was. All right, I don't have a lot of um, of not for nothings. In fact, I only have the one. So you go ahead and get us. Yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a lot. When I'm at Buffalo Wild Wings, I'm hanging out with friends. I'm a little distracted. Um, it's an unbelievably hot bartender there that I checked out like 900 times. So, um, hopefully my wife never listens to this podcast. I don't know why she would. But, uh, <laughs> hey, not for nothing, if you were the guy who was per- kind of like leading the get rid of the flyweight division, I think uh, Figueredo and, and Pantoja made you look like an idiot. That guy should be fired, whoever was leading that pack. Uh, not for nothing, UFC signed more – Flyweights and sign more women's featherweights. Even if they're not the most talented people, you just need to get a roster. Uh, I mean, it's that sad. Not for nothing. Can we figure out this bout order? Can we stop burying ranked fighters? I mean, Yako versus uh, Burrell should not have been on the main card. That definitely should have been Figueredo and Pantoja. Two top five flyweights uh, being buried on the prelims makes no sense to me. And, and not for nothing, my last one, my last time I want to talk about Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. Don't tell one fighter, hey, you should go down in a weight class, and then the next fighter be like, hey, you're an agent, ve- agent veteran. Agent veteran should go up a weight class. You can't tell you, oh, you can't tell Cyborg, hey, you need to go up, and then tell Frank Yager, hey, maybe you, you, you're in your career. You need to go down. Like, give me a break. Yeah, and, and so I'll piggyback off of that. One that just came to me as you were talking is not for nothing, Joe Rogan. The post-fight interview is not for you to carry the UFC's water. And I understand that you're um, – you are employed by them, and I get it. But just because someone's telling you in your ear that you know, hey, maybe uh, mention to Frankie, like that's a that's a weird thing to say in a post fight interview, telling a fighter which direction he should take his career in. I don't think that's serving you well in yeah. the capacity that you're in. So that's my first not for nothing. And, and give him, give him, and give him like thirty, give him thirty seconds to you know be with his kid and and kind of he just lost, he just trained, he's been training for this fight for like two years. Give some time to process it, too. Yeah, I agree. All right, my other not for nothing was, um, not for nothing, well, Frank Yeager said that he wanted to fight with Matt. He wanted to fight with Max Holloway at 145 because he wanted to show his son that size doesn't matter. Not for nothing, Frankie, but you <laughs> proved that point when you won the 155-pound belt. That's right. This That's was a right. legacy fight, and you're shot to be a double champ. Let's not make it into something, you know, that it wasn't. 
So, um, I mean, listen, I'm, I think Frank Yeager and Max Holloway are the kind of guys that we should be putting out there, uh, you know, for our kids and all that to see. Yeah. But that was, that was a weird way to do that. If, if, if size didn't matter, you wouldn't have gone down the fly, uh, featherweight in the first place. You know, and if size didn't matter, you probably would have had a better fight against Max Holloway. So you really aren't sending your son the message yeah. that, you, that you want to send. That's all right, right, let's move on to Shocker of the Night. Go ahead. Uh, this is going to be terrible because usually we try to find some. I don't remember a real shocking moment. So I'm going to go back all the way to the bout order, and I'm going to say uh, Yako versus Laurel being uh, opening the pay-per-view, a, a very irrelevant fight in the meaning of rankings and the, the overall skill set. That shocked me that that one was on the pay-per-view opener. You know, and the way that I am with this stuff, I mean, obviously I uh, you know take full responsibility anytime that I don't um, – scout something as well as I should, but I'll just come right out and say this. I was shocked at Felicia Spencer's chin. I really thought that Cyborg was going to get her out of there. I'm not saying that, you know, I've never seen any evidence of her chin before being, you know, okay, but I was, I really thought some of the shots that she was taking from Cyborg, and I was a little, I was a little shocked with the kind of uh, leather she laid on her. You know what I mean? Cyborg is going to be looking at that scar on her forehead for the rest of her life, and she's been fighting forever. She's fought some, some studs. And no one else left her looking like that. So, I mean, I mean, the new is beat her. But, I mean, that she, she put some, some serious leather on her. So, I mean, while I don't think her performance is in line with what Rogan's commentary was, I do think that she had some moments that I was kind of shocked by them. All right, let's get to from the notebook because you kind of touched on it a little bit. Let's talk about Joe Rogan. All right. I don't have a lot for this one, but the narrative on Twitter last night was Rogan does this thing. I'm going to use the word narrative twice, which is, is very – non-professional of me but <laughs> the rogan creates a narrative and then he just sort of runs with it, runs with yeah it. i 100 agree with he's that. done that for a while right and then sometimes i think it it has worked out better for him now mm. here's where i think i'm a little bit different with this and this is not me defending joe rogan but i will say this i think jim lampley does the same thing in boxing i just think he does it more effectively he tells the narrative of the fight which is what you should do Rogan picks a narrative that works for him and then tries to reaffirm his narrative as the fight goes on, despite what he's seeing. Which is interesting because uh, Chael Sonnen said that some of the best advice he's ever gotten from anybody in terms of his job is from Rogan. And Rogan said, if you don't see it, don't say it. Yeah. And, uh, and Rogan broke his own rule last night because yeah. he was saying things that he wasn't seeing. So let's expound on this a little bit. You touched on it. What are your thoughts? Yeah. No, I 100% agree. He has such an influence being that he's such a popular person and then you're listening to the commentating team. So when the commentating team, they're going to influence, especially fans. Um, he does it in fights. A fight can be very close and he can make it sound like one person clearly wins and then the crowd will say how clearly they won. Um, perfect example is John Jones versus Alexander Gustafson won. Joe Rogan made it seem like Gustafson ran away with that fight. You rewatch that fight without volume on, John Jones wins Clearly wins three rounds, possibly wins four rounds. But Joe Rogan had this narrative that Gustafson is winning, and he talked so many people into thinking that. And then he did the same thing last night. The people, I, I'm like saying, watch that fight again with no volume on. Felicia Spencer gets her ass handed to her. It, it was a one side beat that was one of the best performances, other than a knockout that I thought Chris Cyborg's had. And Joe Rogan had this narrative that he was just going to. And the worst thing is, watch every single time Cyborg lands. He kind of, he doesn't, when Cyborg opens up with a three-punch combination and Spencer, he doesn't shout out like, oh, huge combo. But every single, like if Spencer landed a grazing kick or a grazing punch, it was a big deal. Whoa, good big shot, you know. Um, yeah, that was, it was a terrible performance. So then what's the answer? I mean, is it a case of where we're paying a little bit closer attention? Or maybe, well, hear, hear me out. Do you think that... Like I'm, I'm in the in the camp that Dana White has always been Dana White, Joe Rogan's always been Joe Rogan, and at, at different times we're paying attention to it more. Where like you know certain things Dana will say we'll get upset about. Like Dana's been saying these things for 15 years, you know Joe yeah. Rogan's been doing this thing for 15 years. Is it just a matter of like he's going to be there? One thing I heard last night was that it should have been a three man booth. Do you agree yeah, that Joe I'm Rogan right needs a three man booth now? I he did, did it with yeah, Goldberg. No, I do. I do think they need a three-man booth um, because John Anik's not going to challenge him. It's not going to happen. Mike Goldberg never challenged him. You're not going to challenge him. Uh, 
you're the play by play guy. You kind of you're telling me what's going on. You're you're going to read the spots. You're going to kind of you you organize the flow, but you don't challenge someone. Dominic Cruz would have challenged him, and you need someone to challenge him in that. And I don't understand why. I mean, I get why Cormier wasn't there. He's in the middle of a training camp. Felder's, I believe, is in the middle of a training camp. Or, uh, but why couldn't Michael Bisping do it last night? Why couldn't Dominic Cruz do it? I mean, those both guys have experience. Um, Dominic Cruz has been pay per view ready. I don't know if Bisping has done a pay per view, but if you're gonna if you're gonna throw a guy at pay per view, why not last night? Like that's like it's not a big one. It's not a why not last night? Michael Bisping on there. Um, yeah, they definitely need another guy who I think Rogan respects DC so much that was I don't know that he respects Cruz as much. I think he respects him as a fighter, but I see it's weird, man. The dynamic between Cruz and Rogan is not like the dynamic between Rogan and DC. He seems mm-hmm. Rogan seems a little more deferential. And which is good. Sometimes you need someone to real Joe Rogan. And I think that Anik, Rogan and DC, once DC gets done fighting is gonna be the they'll have a good one, two year run before Rogan gets out of it, I think. Yeah, I, I've been I've been ready for Rogan to move on personally. It'll be weird, but I'm ready for it. All right, let's move on to the overall grade of this card. What'd you give it? A C plus. I think the uh, the main event was entertaining. The co main event was entertaining, but the rest of the I mean the the two big highlights was um, uh, Figueredo and Formiga and uh, Price and Neil, but nothing spectacular. I think Rosa had a really good performance, but nothing spectacular. Not a shocking moment. So that's why I go C, C+. Plus. Yeah, we talked about this before, about whether or not we should be rating things differently if they're fight uh, on ESPN or ESPN Plus or they're on pay-per-view. I, I really didn't feel like this was a pay-per-view card. Um, I agree. So uh, I'll, I'll stick with you on with a C because I did like the I did like some of the fights and I thought that some some moving forward narratives were told about certain fighters, um, yeah. but it wasn't it wasn't a fight that like when I when I hit the stop button on this podcast maybe when I stop thinking about this card. In all fairness, yeah. So, yeah. One thing, one thing I do want to say, so it doesn't get misinterpreted. I think I, I think you'd agree. The main event was pay per view worthy. It right. was just the rest of the card really fell shallow. Like there was nothing else that, uh, like Price and Neil, as exciting as that was, I could have saw that on the prelims. True. All right. Anything else? I mean, what do you have as far as uh, guys that need to go? Any other kind of uh, things that stuck out with you? One thing I want to pitch to you real quick. Um, Maybe moving forward, I want to think about maybe doing like our favorite technique of the night. Because I saw something last night, I can't remember what it was, but it was I hadn't seen it from before, and it was like you know like when John Jones started doing the oblique kicks or like you sure, know sure. somebody yeah, brings like, back a foot stomp, we'll throw those in. Anybody think it should should be out of here based on last night? Yeah, Kyle Stewart. Um, I I hate to speak about a guy who's a former military member. I was in the army myself. This guy was a former marine, very proud of the marine. He just doesn't look like a UC level fighter. You, you got Eric Cope moving up. A weight class and four G years and, and turns you into a wrestling dummy. Um, he he went for a shot and then like somehow he went for a shot and ended up on his back and with Coke didn't do anything. He just he's not a UFC level fighter. So I I would that's the only fighter on this card I would cut um, after this fight is Kyle Stewart. Uh yeah I don't. It's it's a, it's not a fun to say. Let's cut this guy. But, <laughs> but it's a reality. But a lot of people It's a reality it. the of the business. Is, so I mean, well, why I let, why and just so everybody knows, this was my idea to do the cut list because I'm a jerk and I'll, I'm willing to say, hey, cut this guy doesn't deserve to be in the UFC. So hey, change my mind. I'm sure he'll get another shot. You know what? Him. And listen, in, in fairness to you, in fairness to you, the roster is what the roster is. And if and if a guy like Kyle Stewart doesn't go, someone else doesn't come. So I mean, I, you, that's right. That's exactly how I look at it. That's ex- that's somebody else's spot that should be in. And you know what? You could change my mind. I have been wrong about certain fighters. I've been right about certain fighters. Like I've been saying, hey, this guy's not that good, and also that guy doing way better than I thought. Hey, perfect case is Calvin Cater. Calvin Cater, he came up in my local scene, the regional scene. I saw. Eh, maybe gets a couple fights in the UFC, maybe goes like one and three and he's out, and now he's a top ten featherweight. So I, I can be wrong. So yeah, okay, all right. Let's see. Is there anything else going on? We got PFL, we got Bellator. What else is on from all over MMA? Anything else on your mind? No, I mean nothing. There's uh, Robbie Lawler next week. Robbie Lawler and Kobe Covington. That's a that's an interesting matchup. I think it's a fun matchup. Oh, I got one for you. Speaking of that, what'd you think about uh, Tyron Woodley taking pictures with uh, Jorge Masvidal? 
people were saying that he should have done that because Masvidal just put his, it's his best sport. buddy on the highlight reel. It's a sport. Those guys train together at American Top Team for years. I got no issue with it. We think about Covington talking about how Robbie Lawler sort of turned his back on 18, on uh, top, American Top Team. I think it's a perfect angle to promote this fight. There's no other angle. I think Kobe, I, I think Kobe Covington, he needs to he needs to reel back the, the cringy, the sunglasses and the MAGA hat and all that shit and get rid of that cringiness with the girl next to the car. With that. But this, the passion of, hey, this is my team. You know, we brought you in, we helped you. That's a good angle. That that seems real. It seems genuine. Even if it's not, it seems real and genuine, which is fun. I think that's good. But I don't know if you saw this. Dana White said that Colby Covington, if he beats Robbie Lawler, he gets the title fight, not what he mouths about. Now, Dana says a lot of shit, but he said it just last night that if Covington beats Robbie Lawler on Saturday, he fights Kamaru Usman. Yep. All right, there you have it, guys. Another one in the books. UFC 240, UFC Edmonton. Both of us gave the card C, but, you know, we got maybe a, a all-timer in the uh, main event holding his uh, holding his belt. We'll see what's next for him. Guys, listen to the Loudmouth MMA Network, which we are on, which Between the Links are on. We are both, this show and Between the Links, both available in video format on the Loudmouth MMA YouTube. Everything's rolling there. Keith, what else you got working? Uh, nothing, just a contender series. That's the thing I've been kind of cramming like crazy. Um, once the contender series ends, I'm, I'm going to start doing, bringing back some more interviews, um, watching the contender series, digging into the fighters that some people I'm not familiar with, kind of bringing, kind of reigniting a little passion in me to talk to some prospects. So I might start doing some of that more. But uh, yeah, this week, just make sure you check out Sherdog for my contender series. I'll be wrapping up tonight and should be on the website sometime tomorrow on Monday. All right, there you have it. As always, tell your mom, tell your friends, tell your mom's friends, tell your friends' moms. Tell everyone about the Sunday Morning Corner Man. And as the great Alexander Gustafson said, show's over, guys.